much for that nice introduction and for explaining a bit of the VNA. You've you've saved a little bit of work for me, so it's wonderful, and we can get right into it. Um, I feel a little bit like the odd person out in this panel because I'm almost going to be making a presentation that, um, uh, uh, well, not only speaks at the level of objects but pushes architecture into the backstage as a vessel for objects. So bear with me, maybe, maybe you're into that and maybe that's what we need at five o'clock uh, today. Um, but apologies in advance if you don't get as much architecture as you wanted to here. Um, so I'm gonna talk about objects, I'm gonna talk about museums, uh, and I'm gonna tell you about a few projects that I've been working on over the last few years. But I'm gonna um, wrap it up all in this kind of context about uh, the idea of circulation and moving objects and, and what that means for museums, and that comes from a central kind of uh, problem I've wrestled with while working at the museum. And that problem is essentially that um, museums have such rigorous protocols for protecting objects that it's often as if you're caging these objects and you can't really do much with those objects. And that's for a very clear reason, is that um, we are mandated to kind of keep these objects forever in perpetuity. Um, and there are so many dangers that um, that we put our objects at risk uh, on a daily basis. This is just one example. This is Elizabeth Hurley who went to our museum a couple years ago and took it upon herself to sit on this 500-year-old bed um, and take a selfie, uh, which of course is putting the bed in extreme danger and she was promptly kicked out. So there's a lot of concern over like, how do we maintain objects forever? But um, is there something we're missing out by keeping them wrapped up in storage? As was mentioned, the two and a half million objects, most of them not on display. Is there something we're missing out and there's, is there a way of getting them to new audiences and new places, and what can we gain from that? Um, and there's a precedent for this that I always like to reference. This was a department at the VNA that doesn't exist anymore, and it was called the Circulation Department, and it did exactly what its name suggests. Its job was to circulate objects across the country. Um, the idea for this department was relatively straightforward, that the museum itself was um, labeled a national museum. It was getting public funds from the UK government. Um, and so it was thought that um, because this museum is only in London, it wasn't fair for people who lived in other parts of the country not to have equal access to the treasures that are in the collection. So what this department did is that they would um, create tiny uh, mobile exhibitions and th those exhibitions would then travel to different public buildings across the country. So they would be exhibited in um, post offices, uh, libraries, uh, schools, and so on. Um, as a funny side story, that program was shut down by uh, Margaret Thatcher in the 1970s. Um, and so you see that there's um, a real political bent to this, which is left-leaning, um, which doesn't tend to do well in right-wing governments. Um, but along the way, they weren't just making mobile uh, exhibitions. They were also radically rethinking what we could collect in the museum. Um, and this is, again, an argument I'm going to make for circulation. And so they were actually the first, this sounds so naive now, but they were the first um, department to consider everyday objects, um, cheap objects, objects that you could buy at the department store as pieces of design. And so they were the first um, to collect you know, wellies or a radio or, um, you know, uh, everyday uh, home dishware. Uh, so, you know, in circulation, they were able to rethink actually what it is that we can collect, and then rethinking what it is we can collect, rethinking what design is and what we value as design. So I'm going to um, go through three projects relatively, I'll try and get us on time, uh, relatively briefly that I've been working on for the last three years um, in which uh, circulation plays a key role. So I'm going to start with um, the biggest project I've been working on, which is this new museum. And this is the rare bit of architecture that you'll see in this presentation. Um, this new museum that we just opened or helped to open in Shenzhen, China. And it's a project I've been personally working on as the curator of. So Design Society is a new museum of design in Shenzhen, China. It's the first major museum uh, uh, dedicated to design opening up in China. Uh, and the VNA entered into a partnership very early on uh, with Design Society to act as both as a consultant, so to understand how uh, one um, creates the organizational software to uh, run a museum, but also to provide content so that there's a dedicated V&A gallery um, nestled inside Design Society. It's a bit of a Russian doll where it's a building, inside the building is a museum, inside the museum is a V&A gallery. And so this is what we opened um, just last year, and this is what I was curating. So it's a, it's a really eclectic gallery, about 800 square meters, um, and it tells a very broad narrative about design. Um, and I'm just going to go through what this 
essentially circulation project is because we moved objects from the VNA over to China, um, what this allowed us to do. So the beginning point for this gallery was um, we were given a blank slate, we were uh, told um, make an exhibition about design um, and we could do whatever we wanted. Uh, so the beginning point was to understand kind of what the design context in China was at that time um, and it remains relatively the same today, which is a huge ambition um, to invest in design and to invest in design education, to invest in cultural uh, infrastructure for design and divest in creativity hubs. And the reason for that is obviously, as many know here, is that China is going through a transformation in which they want to shift from uh, low-end manufacturing to value-added design as an economic strategy. Um, but you also have this amazing um, demographic change in China that's happened over the last 20 years, which is this monumental rise of the middle class. What happens when you get a new middle class? Middle class people like to um, can now shop for things for their the first time, um, and have a disposable income, and then start defining their lifestyle through designed objects. So designed objects are coming into play um, at multiple levels. So the, the interesting thing about working in China at this time was that you had this word design being used and being floated around by many different people, whether you're a design student, whether you're um, somebody with disposable income, whether you're uh, a government policymaker, and to each of those different people, design had a different value or a different notion. So um, that's a long way of saying we decided to kind of set up this gallery structured around the idea of probing the ways we interpret value in design. Um, and if we look at our collection, and if you look at the history of our collection, you know we've had hundreds of curators collect and add objects to the collection over 150 years. Every time you collect an object into the V&A's permanent collection, you have to make a justification for it. And so in so doing, you basically have to write in words what the value of that object is to the collection. So we used this opportunity to create this very eclectic um, gallery in which we looked at you know, the way designers stated what the value of design was, the way um, contemporary Chinese discourse was stating what the value of design was and the way our curators of the past were making claims to design uh, through these objects. Um, and so what it resulted in was this very thematic display um, in which we break down some of these kind of broad-based values, so performance, making objects do more things better, um, or problem solving, how design can approach some of the greater problems in the world. Um, and we were able to create this in a kind of a very eclectic way. So this, this part of the presentation will be short. It's just to say that this long project in which we were able to make a gallery, um, by bringing those objects to another context, we were able to actually uh, curate something completely different than what we'd be able to curate at the VNA. So if you go to the VNA galleries, they're either around time periods or materials or different design object types. Um, so an object, uh, a gallery in which we can bring together a chandelier of that nature, a Christian Dior dress, a 15th century astrolabe, um, an 11th century ceramic jug, and a 1950s um, a record player uh, had never been done before. So that's again, you know, international projects allow you to experiment with these different kinds of things, different modes of display. So here's a few images of what the gallery looks like. Um, this is designed by Sam Jacobs Studio, if anybody is interested. Uh, massive dichroic walls. And um, this idea of circulation is something we really wanted to emphasize. So I have just a one minute trailer I'm going to play for you now. If you could just press play on that video, and we can watch it. video we just really wanted to emphasize, um, you know, the modern condition uh, today is defined by this vast circulation of goods and objects. Um, 
uh, that are produced in one part of the world, exchanged in the other part of the world. And museums are exactly fitting into that kind of circulatory system. So here we had a museum with objects um, we're collecting in China. Things are moving to our studios. They're moving back um, into the realm of display. And so that was the aims of the video. But to get back to um, another project, to actually jump back in time, um, early on in curating uh, that gallery that you just saw there, we wanted to use the opportunity, and it's a rare opportunity to be actually have people, um, v &A curators, on the ground in China for a dedicated amount of time. Um, and we used that to do a smaller research project which would test out what we might acquire into the permanent collection. Um, and in so doing, try and better understand what the design scene of Shenzhen is like. So Shenzhen has self-proclaimed itself as being a design city through the UNESCO Design Cities platform. Um, and normally as a design curator, one would assess the kind of robustness of a design scene or a design city by kind of looking at the proper studios that existed and kind of counting how many awards people had won and how many critical acclaimed designers were being, you know, uh, were launching their businesses in that city. And in Shenzhen, we felt it was slightly, um, it would it would massively miss out on kind of the kind of design that's happening there because I, as I don't know, I haven't properly contextualized it, but Shenzhen is, you know, a massive manufacturing center in southern China, um, and its entire growth was based on that. And so you have a really robust um, making uh, landscape there. Um, so we wanted to use this project to understand where creativity was happening outside uh, the design studios. Can we assess creativity and design in Shenzhen without looking at designers altogether? So we did a small project called Unidentified Acts of Design. Uh, where we profile actors, the act of making, and the places that happen in the city. So it's a way of mapping out kind of the dyna dynamism of the of the city itself. Um, and we were, you know, deliberately trying to be a little bit cheeky with this. So one of the first investigations we looked at was this phenomenon called Shanjai, which uh, was major in um, Shenzhen around the early 2000s in the production of uh, fake mobile phone. Um, and then it grew into a massive industry. So this is the Huachang Bay electronics market. This is the largest electronics market in the world. And this is really the heart and center of the Shanjai movement. Um, when you go shopping there today, you can find all sorts of funny stuff um, and lots of things that are at actually rather quite successful. So uh, if you look at the far left, um, you'll see a phone and you'll see many types of this kinds of phone that have come out of um, Shenzhen and out of the Shenzhai movement, which is a phone that's been simply designed for elderly people. So it's a very simple phone with very large buttons, an SOS quick dial button, a very loud speaker. Um, and this phone has gone on to become very popular because it's a phone that uh, has been designed for a specific demographic, which is a remarkable thing if you understand or look at mobile phone production today, where you have Samsungs and Apples basically making one model of phone um, and insisting that everybody use that type of phone. Um, here, out of the Shanjai system, you had um, people making phones for different kinds of people. Um, in the middle, you see a karaoke microphone. This is a kind of a, a mashup of two very basic technologies, that of a microphone and that of a Bluetooth speaker. Um, but somebody was clever enough to put the two together. Um, and it kind of goes on and on. And so the market is this vast landscape of electronic parts. Um, it's also a proving ground for where you can sell things and understand what does well and what doesn't do well. And so it's been a place for people, um, small scale manufacturers, to um, try out different kinds of uh, products. Um, from that, you get a lot of new upstarts in Shenzhen who are really capitalizing on a kind of global um, interest in uh, what's called the maker movement, so um, the DIY electronics scene, uh, which has really taken off and which has been characterized by things like Arduino. Um, so you have a group called Seed, um, started by a, a guy named Eric Pan, uh, who once went to an art gallery in Beijing and he saw some interactive art and he saw that they were using Arduino uh, for that interactive art and he had the the idea that he could produce it uh, more cheaply and better um, in Shenzhen. So he moved to Shenzhen. He started this hub where they make small-scale electronic parts. Um, they have really started to advertise Shenzhen as a city for makers, so a place for anybody, uh, young designers, uh, startups, to source electronic parts to make um, 
uh, startup inventions. And they brought the whole idea of a maker fair uh, to Asia. So uh, Shenzhen was the first maker fair in Asia, and it's still the largest maker fair, which is a kind of um, big uh, celebration of uh, maker culture. Um, and they started these makes, maker uh, spaces. Um, and then there's been now an explosion of these maker spaces across China as it's been kind of unofficially adopted in Chinese policy. So you get all this kinds of energy. A lot of these people aren't designers. Um, funny enough, they're uh, mostly coming from an engineer background. So this is one, this is Jason Wang. Um, he started a company called MakeBlock. Uh, and he had, again, a very simple idea. He had an engineering background. He wanted to make a very um, easy to use robotics kit uh, that he could sell to schools so that children could learn how to make robots. Um, and robots need three, kind of, uh, three types of engineering. So computer engineering, electrical engineering, and hardware engineering. And he felt Shenzhen was the place to do it. So he moved to this place, which is um, actually called Hacks, which is an accelerator space. And Hacks um, kind of uh, proves the point how Shenzhen is becoming this very lucrative space to design. Because what it is, it's a, it's a space run by an angel investor, um, the French angel investor named Cyril Ebersweiler. And he invites um, every year a handful of startups to come to Shenzhen for six months. Um, and during those six months, um, they live uh, basically on top of that electronics market. And they have this intense period uh, over the course of six months where they're meant to kind of develop their product and get it off the ground. So um, these two women above us, they're developing an at-home insect harvester for uh, eating insects because they believe insects are the future of our culinary world. Um, and there was a spatial component to this project as well, which is how does the whole how does the whole system work? Um, and how does the whole uh, urban system work to make Shenzhen such a robust uh, manufacturing place? And so there is this phenomenon in Shenzhen and in other cities in China called urban villages, which is basically a kind of land use loophole um, in which people with agricultural rights uh, were able to self-build. Um, and so as cities grew, um, these kinds of pockets of land were, were self-built and they grew to basically as low income workers' housing. So you see these incredible pockets. You can see kind of the black on that map there being this incredible density. Those would be urban villages. And the kind of the light gray being the more kind of standard development that you would see across China. Um, and you can see the kind of the density here in this kind of simple section. But what these, um, not only do these spaces uh, provide really valuable low income uh, workers housing, they also provide really cheap studio spaces. So when um, there's this thing when you want to make a new electronic device and you need to get a circuit board printed, um, you might approach a company and they'll make 10,000 for you, but you maybe only want 10 because you want to test out a different way of doing something. Um, and so what you'll find in these urban villages are very small studios who, which will do rapid prototyping by hand for you. So here's a space uh, where um, about uh, 15 women will hand solder um, uh, uh, microcontrollers for you or uh, uh, chips for you. I'm just going to skip over this one. This is just to say this is another area um, uh, in the city called Dafen, uh, where 10,000 painters live. Um, and they are very famous for making kind of reproduction paintings. So you can get a Van Gogh done. You can get um, whatever you'd like. Um, and what's really interesting, again, from, a, from an urban planning perspective, is that this is a system in which the entire village kind of works together um, as a production unit. So you'll have lots of independently um, employed painters, and we interviewed many of them, who freelance for uh, a distributor. Um, but then there are other services that exist in the city, so uh, in the village. So if you want to make a painting really fast, and you can actually see, if you look at the image at the top right, that kind of faint painting is not a painting yet. That's actually a digital print on canvas. So there's services that will allow you to have a JPEG or a digital file be printed onto a canvas beforehand, and then you simply paint over it if you're in a rush. Um, and you'll have framers, and you'll have a whole um, industry of, of people working to create this enormous economy of, of paintings um, in the village. That's what it looks like here. So all of that research went into uh, a small display we did for the Biennale in Shenzhen in 2015. Uh, and this is what it looked like right here. Um, but more importantly, that research was helping us to make a bunch of new acquisitions that 
would go into the VNA's permanent collection. And again, trying to test and push what it is that we collect. Um, so we have DJI's Phantom Drone. So DJI was another story I didn't talk about here, but it's you know the largest um, drone manufacturer in the world. It got its uh, start in Shenzhen. Um, a drone is not something we would typically uh, collect at the VNA, but because of this project and because of the opportunities we were afforded, we could collect it. We also um, really tested uh, the limits of collecting digitally. So we collected um, the WeChat platform, um, the APK software of that platform, because we thought it was so significant. And it goes on and on. These things are also really important opportunities to bring people together. So we held forums um, in which all these different case studies, the actors that we interviewed, were brought together for discussions. Um, also led to many school discussions. So the last project I'm going to talk to you about is another form of circulation, which is moving the venues in which the VNA um, uh, uh, presents the work, but also talks about a phenomenon that happened at the VNA, which was very much about circulation, which is plaster casts, um, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, we were invited to do a pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2016, and we actually now have this uh, pavilion of applied arts that we get to show at regularly, which is quite quite um, an amazing kind of opportunity to have. Um, and I was asked to curate the first one. And so at that time, I was really captivated by this one room at the VNA. Um, and this room of beautiful sculptures is actually a room full of copies. So these are all um, plaster cast copies that were made in the 19th century. And I found it quite amazing and bizarre that the museum, and as all museums are kind of understood as being places where you go to see the original, that we would have such massive displays and invest so much money in the display of copies. Um, around 2016 was also the moment that we were seeing a lot of these images uh, float through the news. So when ISIS was, um, was attacking and demolishing several sites across Syria and Iraq of uh, significant architectural goods. And, you know, if you can remember back to those days, the kind of horror of feeling, you know, um, loss, permanent loss of, um, of cultural heritage and what to do about it. Um, so the whole Biennale exhibition was premised on this idea that, um, you know, those copies that we have in the cast courts, you know, had we had a copy of Palmyra, um, maybe at least we would have a physical record of it before it had been damaged. So to think, is there a way of rethinking this tradition of making copies in a museum and how would that would look like in the 21st century? So this project was really about looking at preservation, but through the idea of copies. And so we talked a lot about this problem of all preservation, which is that everything slowly deteriorates, but in the 20th and the 21st century, that deterioration is happening even faster because of environmental degradation, because of urbanization, because of terrorism, and so on and so forth. So we show lots of images like this, or like this, um, that were in the news at the time. Um, talking even about how our own admiration and urge to go see cultural heritage is ruining cultural heritage. So this is the, the tomb of Tutankhamun where the carbon dioxide of people's breath is actually deteriorating the tombs inside and so they have to uh, close down the tombs. Um, and to show how, in fact, we live in a world surrounded by copies already. We just might not know it and ways of reconceiving what those copies are. So as we were in Venice, it was good to point out that these four, horse, um, four horses at the top of the basilica um, were, were, are actually copies that were replaced in the 1980s because the original horses were being so badly degraded by um, acid rain. Uh, and now the, the horrifying story is that these horses are so badly degraded, the, the copies, that they'll have to be replaced again. Just a way to show the pace of environmental degradation. Those first four horses lasted 400 years. These four horses lasted only uh, 30 years. Um, and of course, uh, reconstruction after war. So this is the Starry Most Bridge, um, which was destroyed during the, the Bosnian War. Um, or other ideas of, of how we preserve culture altogether. So, you know, in cases in Asia and especially in Japan, this is the Isa Shrine, which is, you know, ritually reconstructed every 20 years. And what is being preserved is not, in fact, the material of the building itself, but it's the knowledge of how to build uh, the shrine that's being preserved. So many ways to think about it. Um, and then in the show, we look at this um, 19th century moment, which was in fact the moment where these plaster casts uh, were 
largely conceived. Um, and you have this amazing document written by the founding director of the VNA in which he's basically asking other museums and making a statement for the reproduction of works of art so that museums can share their works of art more freely, um, so that people can see impressions or copies of those works of art um, in an era where people didn't have the money to be able to afford to travel to Italy or to Paris to see those. So this was written in 1867. And to show the kind of the immense effort, you know, we think about copies as being cheap and vulgar, but the, imme the immense effort that went into creating these copies, this is a reconstruction of Trajan's column from Rome that's placed inside the V&A um, that went on. And the circulation of this, so of course, this also ties into Imperial Britain. Um, so here's the nephew of uh, Henry Cole, the director overseeing cast work in India. Um, and you get a, a whole economy that kind of uh, comes together. And so we have these amazing catalogs uh, by private cast makers uh, in which museums could basically purchase whatever cast they wanted. Um, so it was really uh, an amazing thing. Um, and then we get to this accidental thing that happened. So casts were really made as educational devices. They were made for museums so that public audiences could see different works that they didn't have access to. But because these casts were held in the museum and because museums are so obsessed with maintaining things in perpetuity, um, in many cases, these casts have now become better representations of an original than the original themselves. So I show this object right here. This is a bust. Uh, it's also a copy that we have in the gallery. The original um, of this bust was destroyed in World War II in Berlin. Um, so you have a whole century of warfare, and, you have the, and by consequence, you also have a whole century where Arts, um, artworks are lost forever. And these copies have accidentally become the, the sole remaining um, testament to those pieces of work. A similar story uh, with these casts. We have a collection of 200 casts of architectural details from Cairo. There was a rich French aristocrat who wanted to decorate his house with um, architectural ornament um, in Cairo. So he w went around the city and he kind of illicitly just took casts of details and then fashioned his apartment out of it. But because he was taking casts of details of vernacular architecture, he was taking details of buildings that were never documented in any other way and were most likely all destroyed. So he's created these impressions of a city that no longer exists um, and now that sit in the museum. So you get all these different moments where you're preserving or making snapshots of time which now have kind of added value. Um, again, what's the most ephemeral thing uh, you can think of? It's our own human bodies. They age and then they die. Um, and when you take a life cast of somebody, you're getting a direct physical impression of that person. And these are um, statues or, uh, 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 of hands that were done by Joseph Edgar Boom. So that's just to say that there was this immense moment where copying was um, you know, uh, uh, a highly active process in the 19th century. That's accidentally led to a kind of form of preservation. What would a 21st century cast court look like? Now that we have all these different kinds of digital tools where we can scan, where we can print, uh, and so on and so forth. And so the second half of the show was really looking at different ways we could test what copying means in the 21st century. Um, so this is a, um, this is a CNC milled a uh, replica of this, um, which is a refugee shelter at the Calais jungle. Um, the irony is this Calais jungle refugee shelter was demolished, I think, in December of 2016. So this um, became an accidental kind of monument to that. Um, and it shows you that this was done using a pho uh, process called photography where you can just take a very good uh, DSLR camera, take lots of pictures of a building, feed it through software, and you'll get a fairly good 3D scan of it. It shows you how new digital technologies can react in a much faster way to documenting and recording, but we can also start thinking about documenting and recording things that you know, perhaps are not monumental in nature, but we can actually change their meaning through this transfer of materials and ideas. Um, at the same time while doing this, uh, there was another project that was unfolding relating right back to the Palmyra uh, destruction that I was talking about before. It was a project by the Institute for Digital Archaeology where they had this proposal to uh, make a copy of the Triumphant Arch of Palmyra, 
Palmyra and place it in the middle of uh, Trafalgar Square. Uh, so this is a, a fragment of that that we were able to show. But this is what the unveiling of it looked like. Um, and this was an interesting story in that Boris Johnson was on site to unveil this uh, monument. And it showed quite quickly how uh, digital representations can become immediately political. So at least Boris Johnson's interpretation of this act was a kind of um, a way of refuting the violent acts of ISIS by saying, aha, you can destroy all you want. We can just recreate it um, however we like. So you've destroyed nothing, in fact. Um, that was his position. But this idea that uh, 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 digital information is now floating in the air um, is something that's um, more and more powerful. Um, and this was another project in reaction to ISIS at that time, which was looking at how we can use uh, digital imagery that already exists on the internet um, come up with ways or algorithms of scraping that or harvesting that information. Um, and if you get enough phot photography of a particular image, you'll be able to recreate a, a model out of it. Um, and so this was a project called Project Mosul, uh, where they did in fact just that. They have an algorithm that scrapes imagery and then creates 3D models from that. So the idea is that the internet itself is now a latent storage point for 3D imagery of all our cultural goods, which is quite mind-blowing. On top of that, you have projects like Scan the World. This is a, a young startup who wants to get people. He basically wants to become the YouTube of 3D files and is encouraging people to go into museums, take pictures of objects, make 3D files out of them, and upload them onto his, onto his platform. Um, so soon we'll have more and more of that. Um, and then we get pushback against this idea of the digital world as this kind of latent repository or storage site for cultural heritage. Um, this is a project by Andreas Ingelidakis in which he challenges the digital landscape and says that the digital world is as much uh, prone to becoming a ruin as anything physical. Um, so Andreas' work, he was a very early adopter of uh, making 3D files. Um, and in the early 2000s, he was making these 3D models stored on a website. He once woke up and that website had disappeared and all of his work had uh, disappeared along with it. Um, so he had made it a personal policy of his after that, that he would 3D print any 3D digital model he made. So that the 3D print was now becoming actually the backup to the digital file. So. That's a long way of saying he does a project here where he goes into um, Second Life. And here he's talking about Second Life, the platform is kind of being already a digital ruin uh, in which it was very active 10 years ago and now nobody goes to it. Um, he builds architecture in that and then he recreates that architecture here in this display we have here. And this is just the final project from this show that I'll show you. Um, it's talking about capturing the extreme ephemera um, also related to a lot of what we were talking about earlier. This is a project that I worked together with Forensic Architecture on, in which they were doing already lots of modeling of attack sites in the Middle East um, where missiles were being dropped. And so they had a, a, a lot of um, stored video information about plume clouds. And they wanted to know what would happen if we froze the moment of the plume cloud and rendered that plume cloud 3D. Um, and A.L. Weitzman's idea was that the plume cloud itself is acting as a kind of ephemeral monument. It's an ephemeral monument that creates a political statement that lasts five to seven minutes. Um, so we created these uh, plume clouds that were modeled off of data that they had already been using uh, for research onto human rights uh, atrocities. Um, and actually the smallest um, plume cloud that you see there uh, was the uh, Palmyra attack. So that's just kind of putting some things into perspective for you. Um, to talk about the afterlife, okay, so I, I have this thing about circulation. We did a project that moved to Venice, talked about circulating copies, um, talked about afterlife of projects and what can happen from exhibitions. Uh, UNESCO visited this project. Uh, they were very um, interested in what they could do uh, uh, with us after that. Um, another organization uh, offered uh, to uh, fund a project in which we rewrite that 1867 document. Um, and so we had a big kickoff at UNESCO in which we tried to rethink what uh, circulation of copies means today in the digital uh, era. Um, and that led to a kind of a global collaborative effort between five different museums in which we held round tables. Uh, and we did that all of last year. And we were able to kind of create a new kind of declaration which breaks up this idea of digital reproductions into th three broad challenges. How do we make them? How do we store them? How do we share them? I'm not going to go into the details here because it would be too long. But this is the declaration which has now been signed by I think 25 different museum institutions. 
basically outlining kind of our responsibilities for digital reproductions. That's now led to uh, a book that I edited and we just released it now as Creative Commons. We've never released a Creative Commons book before, but again, this project is trying to push the way the museum operates. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm gonna conclude right there, which is just to say, um, I work at the VNA, but I've never really worked uh, at the VNA proper because all of my projects have been around international work and exchanges and circulating. And I think there's a lot of value to moving objects around, collaborating with different partners, and uh, uh, that's it. It's a museum without architecture. Thank you.